Hi, Matt. Hello. Hi, Raihan. Uh, my name is Raihan Salam, and I'm a policy advisor at Economics 21, a columnist for The Daily, and a blogger for National Review. And I'm here with Matt Iglesias. And I'm Matt Iglesias. I'm a fellow at the Center for American Progress, a blogger in our uh, Think Progress uh, publication, and a columnist for The American Prospect. So, Matt, uh, there's so much going on in the world. Uh, there's a lot of so federal debt-related shenanigans. But also, one, so of the, one of the biggest and most exciting uh, bits of news from the year so far is that you have a forthcoming mini-book, an e-book, The Rent is Too Damn High, possibly the best title ever. Exactly. And uh, do you have anything... An e-booklet. Do you have anything to uh, share with us about uh, your excitement about this book, your lack of excitement, uh, your anxiety I... and dread surrounding it, or anything else? I am super excited. Um, no, you know, it's, it's, it's good. You know, I, I, I write on my blog uh, fairly frequently about sort of urban issues, um, which I, I've always thought, you know, are, are very interesting. Um, and I've been, you know, toying for years with sort of different ways to put something together about, about land use regulations and housing costs and how it really sort of drags down people's quality of life in, I think, a way that's, that's just not very well understood. Um, but I'd always wrestled with it because you sort of, you can't talk about cities without talking about crime, without talking about schools. Um, and those are all very complicated, very contentious issues. So I, every time I would try to even do an outline, it would sort of like sprawl out of control. <laughs> um, you know, just to the point where it was like, it, it made no sense. And, and nobody wants to read my sort of treatise on education reform because it's not, it's not in any way original. You know, um, I, I have ideas, but they're just stolen from other people. Um, but so then I read... You're a synthesizer, I read, Matt. It's not, it's not the same as theft. You, uh, you in, 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 in my dreams, <laughs> yeah. Um, no, no, no. But then I, I, I read Tyler Cohen's uh, e-book, e um, the, the Great Stagnation, and it hit me that, like, yes, that my problem was that I had about 20,000 words worth of things that I wanted to say, and that the solution was to just publish something 20,000 words long. Um, yeah, I'm very pleased. Know, so, I mean, I think so, that, you know, there's so many, that's the so dream. much opportunity for innovative self-publishing, and uh, just, you know, there are all these people I know who uh, are journalists, etc., but who really want to write fantasy novels, and there's a great anxiety attached to that, and now the, you know, the bar, you know, it's somewhat more open to different kinds of product, to serialized products, etc. The one thing that I wonder about is, um, I'm hoping that, your book is also going to touch on uh, how density might relate to spurring economic growth. In a way, I feel as though your book could be a complement to Tyler's book, not just um, in terms of its form, but also in terms of the uh, the actual substance, the actual content of what you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I have a, a, you know, there's a there's a few different cuts of this, but certainly, and and you know, of course, I, I don't want to say too much until actual actual <laughs> publication. Um, you know, but what, one of the arguments I, I have is that um, we've obviously moved from an economy, it, we've become an economy in which what most people are doing is sort of performing services for each other. You know, yeah. I mean, we still, we, we have banks, we have factories, uh, we, we do various things. But, you know, t typically people are, you know, we're cooking meals or treating injuries or teaching yoga classes or teaching regular Or writing classes. opinion journalism um, for people who are relatively affluent and who are looking at advertisements along the side of their... Right. But I mean, particularly, you know, in, in employment terms, I mean, it's like the, the big growth industries are just like things you have to do face to face, yeah. you know, or, or things that are that are tied to specific locations. Because, uh, you know, we nowadays we, we have all these Chinese people, um, you know, who can do things that you could put in boxes and, and ship. Um, but the the productivity in those kind of personal service industries uh, is very low. And the wages in a lot of them tend to be quite low. Um, and in response to that, the sort of primary reaction people have is a kind of um, industrial age nostalgia, where people just kind of talk about how, well, we need to make things again, and, and blah, 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 blah. Um, and there's no sort of policy solution really offered there. I mean, you, you can't actually turn back time um, and, and rebuild uh, an industrial economy of, of 50 years ago. But what you can do is actually look at 
why is the personal services economy so low productivity, so low wage? Um, and one of the main reasons I want to suggest is precisely that we don't allow for enough density. So we have too much housing costs. We don't um, crowd enough people into the areas where the job opportunities are really vibrant. And we don't take advantage of the ways that high density allows for sort of really perfect um, matching and, and sorting. Um, like you live in, in New York, uh, I believe, yeah. right? I do. And, you know, as is well known, I mean, New York has way more people than other American cities. Uh, It's much more crowded. And that results not just in sort of more stores, but actually different ones. You know, there's complete niche tastes that only under the sort of very crowded conditions of big cities can you even have certain kinds of shops, certain kinds of restaurants. And then... Um, you know, creates value in the skills that people have that's otherwise sort of lacking. Well, it's interesting. I think about this a lot in terms of thinking about the your subjective experience of life. And if you are able to kind of uh, phase out commuting, I talked to a gentleman who is one of the uh, co-founders of LiveOps, this remote call center operation. Mm-hmm. And he was talking about how when you look at someone who, you know, you have some years of college, uh, you say uh, want to spend a lot of time with your family, but you're living in a kind of rural part of Georgia, cutting out commuting costs, cutting out other costs associated with kind of having to go to work regularly, including some things relating to one's wardrobe and one's uh, you know, eating out, etc., you suddenly have Mm -hmm. a fair bit of disposable income relative to what you might have had using some of these technologies. But also when you think about the opportunities in dense cities, um, you know, think about living in Los Angeles. If you don't have to commute regularly, suddenly your life becomes radically better than it would have otherwise. Um, The one thing that I I wonder about, I mean, I've written about a related puzzle um, in a somewhat provocative way by suggesting that in the future we can imagine that... um, you know, among the more privileged jobs, the more desirable jobs will be uh, a servant or a nanny. And right now we think of those jobs uh-huh. as very low wage, low skill. But I mean, I think that, you know, in light of your framework, it, it does seem as though one of the big problems is just disconnectedness, a situation in which many uh, people uh, who kind of don't have adequate job opportunities, it's literally because they're so far away from them. And enhancing their mobility becomes a much easier problem to solve when they are living near rich people. Um, you know, right. in terms of time and also in terms of space. Um, so yeah, I'm very, very excited about this book. And there are a number of little kind of urban problems relating to the idea of the rent being too damn high. Uh, we have rioting in London, which is, of course, is very kind of specialized and thorny circumstance. And then we have this, these yes. huge encampments in Tel Aviv. Uh, but have you been observing any of this international urban related disturbance stuff and thinking through its implications or anything like that? I mean, I, I certainly did think it's you, it's interesting always to look at, um, at a situation in, in Israel uh, that doesn't have, you know, a sort of like direct tie to the to the conflict with, with the Palestinians. Although an indirect uh, tie, possibly. I, I do think it does. Uh, well, as, as obviously everything does in that region. But, you know, the thing about um, uh, that particular you know, uh, the sort of main population center of uh, Jewish Israel, you know, in Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv suburbs going north into, into Haifa, is that it's just like, it's a great place. You know, it's it's like um, the really nice parts of California. Yeah. Um, in, ter- in terms of climate, y- you know, there's beaches, um, it, it's lovely. And then like the Bay Area, it's a, it's a huge cluster of high-tech, um, you know, big money uh, uh, kind of businesses up, up around there, around Herzliya and, and the university there. So, you know, it's very prosperous and, and it's, you know, it's, 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 it's wonderful and it's not um, politically contested territory either. I mean, pe- people don't shoot rockets at you, uh, there's no checkpoints, yeah. you know, it's, it's great. Um, but... Just like in the west side of Los Angeles or uh, the San Francisco Peninsula, you can't, uh, there's a lot of restrictions actually on how densely built uh, it's allowed to become. Um, And, you know, a result of that is that it's extremely expensive to to live in those places. Um, And in, you know, in America, what you get when we create this situation is you get like sprawl, you know, so people don't live in Santa Monica, they live in Riverside County. Um, And, you know, Los Angeles keeps sort of snaking east away from the coastal climate that made it desirable in the first place. Um, You know, and so you look at that and you say, okay, well, you know, that's that's too bad. Um, 
you of course can't really sprawl anywhere in Israel because it's really little and most of it is a desert. Um, and so part of what you've had instead is the government saying, well, look, you know, there's all this affordable housing uh, in the West Bank. Um, and, you know, many people move into these settlements out of very firm ideological... And, of course, many others, sort of because you have subsidized housing and you have access to yeah. the land. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. And, and particularly the sort of... The, the settlements that are most entrenched in Israeli politics are the ones that are big and close to the border and, you know, mostly inhabited by pretty normal people who... You know, I, you know, like people everywhere, they like their houses and they don't want to give them up and move. Yeah. Uh, but obviously, Palestinians also don't want to give up their land. Yeah. Um, and there's a stability of expectations so it's, issues. Yeah. No, that, that absolutely makes sense. Um, you know, and so it's... And you see, I mean, you see in Washington, D.C. or you see in Brooklyn, um, you know, much less freighted sort of gentrification dynamics uh, make people extremely upset. Um, and then, you know, you, you add the level of religious conflict and, you know, imbalance of military power and, and stuff that you have up there. It's obviously a, a situation of a, a totally different nature. Um, but the basic economic drivers of, you know, uh, no permission to build, housing scarcity, so then people sort of move on and existing uh, residents are, are displaced. Um, you know, it, it's something that we see all around the world. I spoke to a friend of mine recently who was talking about the slice of Montana that she's from, which is a you know, very beautiful, picturesque slice of it. And she was talking, lamenting the fact that her cousin, who now installs sprinkler systems uh, in much in, a, in the town in which he grew up, he, and it's now quite right. difficult for him to afford to live there. And, you know, my response to this, my kind of characteristically random and, and arguably heartless response was that, you know, it's entirely imaginable that had this remained a kind of beautiful, untouched place that outsiders hadn't discovered, uh, this cousin would have moved to Seattle or somewhere else. I mean, depending on how... Now, naturally, it is entirely plausible that he has a deep connection to this place, but also there's the kind yes. of classic gentrification dynamic in which people... There's a very high level of volatility, uh, certainly in urban right. neighborhoods, and that people simply want to stay longer. But speaking of volatility in urban neighborhoods, um, one thing that we've been hearing a a lot about, and you know, as someone who has a lot of ties to London, uh, are the riots in London right now, and then the yeah. inevitable sense uh, of dread about whether or not we might see something parallel happen in the United States, which uh, you know led me to revisit some older literature, for example, from Ed Glazer from the uh, the mid '90s, and others about what are the origins of this kind of urban violence. But have you has that been your instinctive reaction? Uh, when will the other shoe drop? Will we see some kind of urban violence here, or have you been more sanguine about that prospect? I uh, no, I mean you know I think it's it's sort of been natural to wonder, um, in some ways I almost wondered more, you know, two years ago, like, you know, are, are, are we going to have uh, uh, riots or, or something like that with the, with the economy collapsing? And then we didn't, um, which was nice. Uh, but, you know, now you see it, I mean, we saw it in Greece first, really, which I guess... Um, I don't know, you know, most of us, I guess we think of, we think of the Greeks as very, uh, you know, hot-tempered and, and Mediterranean, so, so maybe they riot. Um, uh, you know, and there's also England some like, low-level anarchist violence in London earlier on this year on Trafalgar Square, and there were some other kind of right. flash points, yeah. But, you know, London, it, you know, England is a, similar to American society uh, in, in a lot of ways. Um, we have a lot of discussions in the United States now about big cutbacks in, uh, you know, discretionary spending programs, uh, to some extent, uh, you know, that's a trail that's been blazed, uh, by the coalition government in, in the UK. Um, so, you know, I mean, it, it, it definitely makes you, makes you think, um, although I, I don't actually know very much about the particular dynamics of, of this, this one. It's also extremely, extremely thorny and controversial. I mean, there, uh, for example, has recently been a lot of talk about how the riots have been coordinated through, um, so-called Blackberry, uh, messenger messages, uh, which, you know, are right. available for almost zero cost. Uh, and it's, this fascinating phenomenon, and also a lot of people, a lot of outsiders, and we won't actually know, we won't really be able to excavate this until, you know, long after they've 
they flamed out. But there is this sense that it's a group of, you know, certainly not impoverished, certainly not socially isolated kids uh, for whom this is almost a festive occasion in which people are rushing to um, the scene of rioting. And of course, that isn't true in every instance, but it is a very weird and to some very creepy uh, phenomenon. I think that when you look at the United States, I mean, one of the things that uh, Glazer, for example, argued back in the mid 90s is the idea that, you know, poverty isn't necessarily what correlates all that tightly with uh, urban violence. But, you know, certainly mm -hmm. um, unemployment, non-employment, uh, what one might want to call idleness, uh, just when you look at like the, the cost of your time, if the opportunity cost of your time is somewhat lower, that might contribute to this. But also it relates to policing and American cities are arguably uh, much more aggressively policed uh, than London. And actually right. one of the things that we've seen um, very strikingly are these videos of the police, um, the Metropolitan Police, getting overrun rather more quickly than you'd imagine any American police force getting overrun by gangs of teenagers. Well, and I saw, I, I saw just earlier today, you know, a report that the London police might start using rubber bullets, um, you know, into like the third day of rioting, yeah. which just struck, I, I mean, it struck me as funny. I mean, I, I, I remember I got shot at uh with with rubber bullets uh it'd be oy, over 10 years ago now in, in boston uh in a in a disturbance that i i would hardly have called a riot at all well i'm sorry what were really? you what were you doing getting shot at by rubber bullets was this a riot on behalf of neoliberalism what was going on that's, I think, actually probably the best way, the best way to understand it, that it was, there was a clash between uh, Al Gore supporters and uh, Ralph Nader supporters <laughs> outside the presidential debate at the, at the JFK oh Library. Oh, my God. So I, I think you could say that I was in a pro-neoliberalism mob. Um, <laughs> So it's, it's kind of like this, uh, you know, version of, I guess, the Trotskyists battling against the Stalinists, uh, you know, at City College, only with rubber bullets. That is only with rubber Well, yeah, bullets. so the, I mean, the, the cops, um, the point is, you know, it wasn't that big a deal. Yeah. Uh, but the cops first, you know, their go-to response was that you have to nip this in the bud and disperse the crowd before something happens. Yeah. Uh, you know, because... Only a tiny number of people have any interest in, you know, raging street battles about uh, Al Gore versus Ralph Nader, right? I mean, it's, it, you know, no, nobody cares. Um, but, the, but the risk is that if it becomes the kind of thing where it's like, oh, hey, there's a riot. Right. You know, maybe if I'm like a teenager who likes to get up to no good. I mean, I, I remember I, in New York in, in 1994, after the Rangers won the Stanley Cup, um, uh, you know, I was like a kid. I was 14 or something. Uh, so you've been at the scene of a number of, of urban yeah. violent outbreaks. Well, exactly. I mean, I, I, I went outside and there were lots of people hooting and hollering. And, you know, I ran into some drunk, like, NYU students, I, I think they were, because there were dorms around there. And, you know, they were trying to flip a car over. And, you know, I, so I was 14, and there were people flipping a car over. So, of course, I joined. I like the idea. <laughs> so, okay, so you're kind of like the zealot of, uh, you know, kind of American riot history, sort of the history of minor American riots. This is, <laughs> you need to factor this uh, in. Yeah. Book, I think this is. No, this is, this is, it's, it's going to be my, my sort of version of Forrest Gump. Right? <laughs> Ambling through small scale urban. Oh farming. my god. <laughs> no, no, but yes, no, absolutely. You want to nip this kind of violence in the bud. I think that one clear way to nip this violence in the bud is to put some kind of ankle bracelet around Matt Iglesias' ankle and then to monitor wherever yeah. he happens to go just in case it erupts into some kind of urban disturbance. Um, but we, uh, <laughs> we, have, we have a federal. Uh, issues to discuss. You're in our nation's capital, and you probably are directly yes. responsible for much of the chaos that we've seen over the last few weeks. Um, and I want you to admit culpability. Um, uh, but so there's a there's no been a downgrade. There's been a downgrade from AAA yeah, how, to AA plus. Yes. And uh, how do you feel it's about that? Shocking. <laughs> do you do you think of it as even? Oh, I, I actually it? think. Oh, sir. Th th this is the main thing. I, I think it's been really funny to watch, like every political pundit in America need to develop, like, strong views about sovereign <laughs> Um I have one strong view, which is that Germany... Right, I, I, I would... 
I would just love to know, like, how many of the people who are on television opining about this could, like, quote Standard & Poor's definition of what the difference between an AA plus and an AAA rating is. Oh, I certainly couldn't. Yeah. You know, uh, right. I mean, nobody can. I, you know, I, I looked it up, and it's like, it, it's totally hand-waving. They say, like, I, I think the exact phrase is that it's almost the same, um, <laughs> but slightly elevated risk. Of something. And so, I mean, who among us is to say that there's not a slightly elevated risk? Of, of, I, I mean, I, I hesitate to make light of it because obviously um, um, there are potential real world consequences of, of this kind of thing. But it's like, it, it is almost like the, the difference between the, the different um, high classes of, of sovereign bond ratings actually has a sort of like angels dancing on the head of a pin you know, quality to yeah. it. Um, nobody, nobody has ever like really known like why Taiwan is AA, but Hong Kong is triple A, <laughs> you know, I, in, in both cases, right. They're exposed to a certain amount of like communist China risk, um, <laughs> of different kinds that I think is difficult to quantify. Um, and you know, I, I think, think Taiwan is exposed to slightly less. I mean, they <laughs> <laughs> a little bit more room, but yeah. No, no, I, I take your point. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's like they're, they're it's, I, I mean, I don't know. They're, they're judgment calls. I mean, it, you know, you, you can take out, and people have, all, all kinds of hits on uh, the, the ratings agency's um, uh, conduct with, with regard to the, the mortgage-backed securities. Um, and Nate Silver's post but those kind concerning of... uh, some of the basic elementary errors. Donald Barron has also written about this in the S&P analysis of the United States, which raises questions about the quality of their analysis vis-a-vis -vis other uh, countries for uh, for whom the kind of data is less commonly available. Um, yeah, it does seem like, you know, kind of uh, sort of even the slightest scrutiny does lead us to think that, um, you know, these guys aren't necessarily incredibly on point. Well, but it's also just, you know, I, I mean, I do think that the the fine-grained distinctions between different tiers of highly rated sovereign entities really are just guesstimates about politics. Um, and that's not that's not their fault, exactly. I mean, I, I'm not sure how much technical analysis is supposed to get you. Yeah. You know, when, when you're talking about uh, these... These kinds of things, right? I mean, um, it was calculated to generate a lot of interest and attention for them, and I think it's one of those things where you know you were discussing earlier on pundits obligated to comment on this. It's all, it's almost you know, there's a thing where making a polarizing judgment call can actually be very, very good, uh, particularly you know vis-a-vis -vis S and P. I mean, and given all of the criticism the ratings agencies have received earlier on, it. If I were making a calculated bet about when you're going to get a lot of exposure and attention, when it makes sense to make some kind of polarizing call that actually isn't going to be that consequential, uh, you know, from this kind of very narrowly self-interested perspective, I can absolutely see why they would have made that call. I mean, you know, they're... Right. Uh, I mean, that's perhaps, you know, kind of... And, you know, I mean, some, something that I think is interesting is that this... Um, you know, the, the downgrade is a very political intervention, and they were citing sort of very political reasons for it, and it, and it created a lot of very political, you know, commentary, um, which, which is what happens. Um, and it has no real-world consequences on its own. Um, but now they're going through a process of re-rating a lot of municipalities. Oh, which is a much um, bigger deal, yeah. Which is a big deal, and where, in an interesting way, not that it's uncontroversial, but I think it's much less contentious to make the basic point that um, one thing we saw in the debt ceiling crisis, and we saw it earlier in the appropriation standoff, and we see it again in, in the fact that we're going to have another uh, appropriation standoff, is that um, the odds are quite good of some kind of disruption in federal payment to state and local governments happening, and that... That means that with a lot of municipalities in a, you know, somewhat delicate fiscal posture, um, that you do need to really consider th the possibility that, you know, arguments in D.C. will lead to some kind of lapse in payments going out to different kinds of local entities, and that local entities that don't have large fiscal buffers uh, may therefore, you know, wind up in... in in serious problems. Um, you know, I have no idea how you translate that into funny combinations of letters and plus signs. Right. Um, 
But, you know, I mean, that's a totally reasonable judgment. And I, I actually don't see anyone disputing it. Um, and yet, that's the, that's the thing with real consequences. I mean, it's a real problem if, you know, Lackawanna County um, can't roll over its debts at an affordable This also reminds me, Not when to you pick think about uh, all the anxiety, the, in my view, the appropriate anxiety about public sector workforces, uh, it's important for people to remember, or even about public sector uh, spending writ large, that the real action has happened, uh, you know, at the state and local level, and specifically at the local level. It's incredible when you look at the share of public employment that happens at the local level. Obviously, a lot of that's K-12 teachers. But also, when you look, yes. you know, from now, you're going to see an explosion uh, in federal spending, say, from 2021 on. But when you're looking at the increase in federal spending from, say, the early 1960s to the present, actually a huge amount of it was happening at the state and local level. So um, I definitely agree with you uh, when you look at um, the rating of municipal bonds, et cetera. It's, it's actually a much bigger deal than people understand. Uh, and it's also something that you know, at least some people have suggested, and I think this is perhaps alarmist, but uh, if you saw a wave of municipal defaults, municipal bankruptcies, that this might itself engender uh, a seizing up of, of the financial markets, and uh, that is uh, certainly not a very attractive prospect. Um, but I think that, you know, provided that you stay away from potential urban riding situations, I think that we should be safe. But I think that it's really crucial that you yes. stay indoors, Matt. I think that's a, that's a good that, that is the dream. That is the dream. No, but I mean, it does mean that, the, I mean, a variety of different factors are, are coming together that suggest, um, you know, we, we might, um, you know, have, have really, you know, kind of big rollbacks in the numbers of, uh, police officers, for example, um, in, in some parts uh, of the country in, you know, fiscally weaker cities. Um, because, it, I mean, it really is striking. I mean, something like, you know, 85% of the politics that people talk about is federal politics um, in, in the federal level. Um, and the federal government is a very big share of, you know, overall spending. But uh, a lot of that is just like the Social Security checks uh, going out. Um, and the the uh, the much largest share of uh, actual government workers are, are working for for counties and, and municipalities, um, you know, in the schools, in and in other kind of you know frontline services, um, and you know that's where a, a lot of the political pressure for cutbacks is. That's sort of and, and you see it coming from from people of both both kind of parties because there's a you know, a certain ineluctable math um, to during a recession, if you have balanced budget requirements, if you have legacy pension costs. Yeah, and I think that that's, that's exactly what I wanted to, to meeting that's to exactly lay what people I wanted off. To stress. I mean, it's also when you look at the cost of, you know, when you look at the cost of health benefits as well, the thing that I find depressing about the recent wave of public sector layoffs is the question of how much of this could have been mitigated if you had had more concessions. Uh, in the sense of, you know, non-cash compensation. Um, you know, it's become a cliche in our corner of the world, but this idea that when you look at teacher salaries, for example, it might be better to have higher starting salaries and higher cash compensation and lower non-cash compensation. The problem, I guess, is that this has all happened at such high speed that there hasn't been an adaptation to this new landscape and what it might mean. Even when you look at the debate surrounding uh, the 2009 fiscal stimulus, there was, you know, this real divide. I mean, do you believe that this is a temporary downturn and that a V-shaped recovery is at least possible? Or do you believe that this is a kind of multi-year uh, period of contraction, stagnation, whatever you want to call it? And if it's the former, then certain policies make sense. Well, let's sustain spending during this period of time, et cetera. If the latter is true, then you definitely want to do things that are structural that will allow you, for example, to sustain, you know, a good sized public workforce, but at somewhat lower cost because you have people bearing more of the cost of their own, um, you know, non-cash benefits. Or, you know, there are all kinds of other ways. I mean, I, I tend to think that the case for infrastructure spending at a, a very large multi-year infrastructure spending campaign would have been stronger circa 2009 if people had believed, or perhaps the better term is understood, that this was actually a multi-year problem. Um, and, yeah. Yeah, well, but, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, Something, something that I, I've certainly, you know, remarked on um, contrasting, you know, our experience of, of fiscal stimulus with, with the experience of a, a Germany or, or a Sweden is just that we have a, there's a really big gap um, in vision uh, in the United States about 
you know, what the size and shape and scope of the public sector should look like um, in 10, 20, 30 years. Um, because of that, you know, I think it's, you can, you can paint this in a sort of conspiratorial uh, light, which, which I don't mean to do, but it's, you know, you have a lot of people who very sincerely believe that you need to make a, a change that will um, alter the trajectory of public employment and spending on public employment in, in the United States. Um, a big shortfall in, in state and local tax revenue uh, combined with Republicans winning lots of elections is a, you know, like perfectly good opportunity to do that. Um, and people naturally, uh, you know, don't want the federal government to take measures that would spoil, uh, you know, you know that, that kind of opportunity. Um, in an ideal world, you know, you would address these questions somehow on completely separate tracks. Um, but there's no, you know, there's no way to operate. Well, and obviously there's, a, there's an outburst. Much e it's much easier... <laughs> To manage. There's also, you know, kind of yeah. a case in which when you look at the uh, the period of the Great Society, I mean, you have this unusual period of unified government and also, as you wrote recently, the sense of a popular mandate and that creates this momentum to uh, affect large-scale reforms. I think that there was a brief moment in 2009 when many people believe that the initiative had shifted to a certain vision of progressive democratic governance, and then there was obviously going to be resistance from others on that part. I, I do think of it somewhat differently, and I think of it... Uh, you know, relating to this whole idea of agendas and instability. There have been lots of folks on the left and lots of folks on the right who have had certain uh, ideas, agendas that they wanted to implement. And I think that on the right, you certainly see that vis-a-vis -vis public sector compensation, uh, public sector work rules, etc. And yes, it's certainly true that now is an opportunity to implement some version of that. But what I think concerns me is that you know, what I take to be the best version of that approach, the one that's relating to kind of long-term fiscal sustainability, even that was actually hard to implement in a very good and constructive way just because of the speed with which everything was coming at you. Uh, and I think that also there are a lot of people, you know, in the center, center right space um, at the state and local level for whom, well, if the federal government had given conditional assistance to state and local governments, and, and I acknowledge that this is very hard to do, people were trying to move quickly, and it's not as though they had, you know, unlimited amounts of time to figure out how to game this out. But if that had been the case, perhaps there would have been more impetus for this kind of structural reform that could have, um, you know, as we pointed out earlier, uh, preserved X number of jobs at lower cost through compensation reforms and by giving those governments more yes. leverage to achieve those compensation reforms. So I think that... Although, you know, I, I mean, what, what, one thing we've seen, uh, I think, that's, that's come out that should... Um, serve as just a cautionary tale to, to everyone, is that a, a lot of the most sort of, um, I think, persuasive critiques of, of the Recovery Act that, that have come out in the literature have shown that a lot of the conditional grants that were in it actually didn't have... Stimulative impact. Yeah. Intended impact. Well, I mean, I mean they, they just, they didn't... They, they had a lot of conditionality requirements written in them, and there was a lot of uh, grant application writing and a lot of, you know, scrutiny and, and yada, 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 yada. But that the money turns out at the end of the day to be much more fungible than the people writing the laws. Oh, uh, yeah. And also, you know, like, when you look at this... Um, wanted it to be... When you look that, at this new analysis state, from state Fair budgeting. and Sacerdote, yeah. it's also... I mean, a lot of what we saw happen is just crowding out of state and local borrowing, which I think is actually a good thing, but, right. you know, it's not necessarily the good thing that people imagine it was going to be. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's one of those things where there's there's going to be a lot of stuff that's going to confound your expectations. There's going to be a lot of shifting, as you described. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm very torn because, I mean, I'm very drawn to the kind of Christopher Edley Jr. approach of maybe we should have structured this as an advance against, uh, advances against future transfer, some fairly straightforward mechanism. But of course, you know, we live in a democracy. And in a democracy, people are always able to revise whatever settlement you come up with, which is, of course, true of the debt deal right. uh, that, you know, we debated uh, so intensely over the last few weeks. And that I think, you know, the great anxiety there, certainly on the part of a lot of conservatives, is that, look, we want more cuts immediately, because that's the only thing we can really grasp our hands around and can actually see. Whereas these future cuts, you know, that may or may not happen, depending on how the political configuration changes. And I wonder, I mean, what 
is your thought on the debt deal, is your view the view that I find a lot uh, among folks on the left, which is that it's a huge step back, it's a huge reversal? Or do you think of it as actually fairly trivial uh, in its implications? I think that the debt deal as written is fine. I mean, it's not what I would do, but, you know, in a dealy kind of way, it's, it's okay. Um, but, you know, I mean, it constitutes a, a kicking, kicking of the can down the road, blah, 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 blah. Um, and it's in part because, you know, uh, Ross Douthat wrote about, you know, people looking for sort of wipe out uh, elections or, or, or this and that. Um, you, I mean, conservatives have talked a lot about sort of the, the problems with promising future cuts, but, you know, what, what both parties have put on the table in terms of their visions for Medicare um, is one version or the other of, you know, cross our fingers, you know, swear that in the future uh, some kind of drastic changes are, are going to take place. Um, and... You know, there's there's an inherent credibility problem around that, and I think what both people, what both sides uh, need or, or want or, is to actually like persuade voters that they're correct, <laughs> right? I, I mean, that in some ways, like what what to me would be like the credible change is not anything Congress can do, but if I, if I heard people saying like, yeah, the government just shouldn't really commit to paying whatever health care for senior citizens costs. Like, then Paul Ryan has won a credible victory. You yeah, know, that, that will be durable. That will be politically it, durable it, rather than something that will just it, get pulled back. Yeah. Because, you know, it's just, right, I mean, like, what's durable, ultimately, you know, because I, I, I can imagine thinking of cynics and, and whatnot, someone looking at, like, the Civil Rights Act, and saying, well, this is no big deal, you know? It's like just some regulation, and next time, you know, Nixon's going to get in, and, and he's just going to gut it, and we'll go back right. to segregation or, or something. Um, you know, that's the kind of thing people would say about, like, financial regulatory changes, right? Um, but the difference is that the Civil Rights Act was part and parcel of, like, an actual change in people's thinking about the acceptability of racial segregation, yeah, no, right? this is a... I mean, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't just a, just a legislative change, right? And so if, if anyone felt like, if Paul Ryan, if, if congressional Republicans felt like they could impose drastic Medicare cuts, like now, and that then they could win an election on the basis of, it's so awesome that we took away people's health care... I want to highlight how much this is. I want to highlight just because I'm. I know that your yeah. narrative makes a lot of sense to me as you describe it here, and I just want to highlight how different it is from a lot of other reactions uh, from the left to the deal. I mean, there's so many people who believe that it represents a profound betrayal, and I think that the fact that there are people who represent that you know uh, that it represents a profound betrayal, I think that actually bolsters or that's led some conservatives into believing that it's more of a win than it actually is. Whereas, I mean, I think that, you know, as Arnold Kling observed, for example, the cuts in it are considerably smaller than the cuts in Bull Simpson. That doesn't mean that the cuts are trivial, but it does mean as though it actually is something where there's a lot of wiggle room, as you say, and also where the real battle continues to be the battle for public opinion. And one cliche that we saw emerge from the debt deal right. is this idea that, you know, the Republicans believe that they're, they will be able to run effectively against the threat of tax increases, and Democrats believe that they'll be able to run effectively against the threat of deep Medicare cuts. And so you kind of go back right to where you started. There's no sense in which what the president seemed to have wanted, which was some kind of concession on the part of Republicans so that he would have uh, the ability to move forward with, for example, some uh, fairly substantial change on the revenue side without fear of being attacked. Um, from his right flank. So I think that, you know, it's kind of, it kind of preserves the status quo ante uh, in a way that I think people don't fully appreciate. Right. It's, it's not, it, it layers on new, um, you know, kind of twists and turns and new devices, new kind of legislative gimmicks. Uh, and, you know, kind of some of them might be perfectly sound, some of them might work out very well indeed, but it just doesn't seem like something that's represented any kind of sea change in one direction or the other. Well, and, you know, I mean, the, the, the traditional Washington mentality is that there's a way to solve these kind of problems. And the way to solve them, I mean, this is what Bull Simpson represented. 
it seems to be what the president was trying to do. Um, it was what, you know, the bipartisan policy centers uh, Peterson Project Report did. It's the classic Peterson idea, which is that um, members of both political parties of sufficient stature should get together and put together a, a series of unpopular changes um, simultaneously enact them as a package, and then sort of say to the voters, um, well, too bad. Like, no one can accuse anyone of having done this because we all did it together. And that's that's the classic, you know, Washington uh, deal-making uh, paradigm in, in which uh, the, our government has, has often operated. But it depends on um, a real sort of looseness in the party structures where, um, you know, members of the opposition party in Congress are more interested in this sort of like very narrow question of like what's on the table legislatively this week than they are in a you know a, a longer term project and we've had a real evolution of, of party structures such that you know I, I just I, I don't think it would be considered acceptable by not just the the base but the rank and file members of Congress for leaders to go and cut deals like that um, in, in the way that was done in the mid-80s. Um, and, and yeah, and one thing that I find interesting is just this idea of the credibility of one's intransigence, an idea that Ross Douthat recently discussed, and an idea that came up in a recent radio program. I was on a radio program with Dave Weigel and Karen Tumulty, and I was just talking about the expiration uh -huh. of the 2001 and 2003 tax cuts. And, uh, you know, just talking about the possibility that those might be expired, a possibility that Josh Barrow and, and many, many, many others have raised. And her reply yes. was, well, I just don't believe that the Democrats would do that. <laughs> and then Ross more recently said, right. well, yeah, I mean, the fact that, you know, it's actually not credible, the fact that so many conservatives believe the Democrats would never allow the, uh, the so-called middle income tax cuts uh, to be, you know, to, to actually uh, get, you know, to expire along with the rest of the uh, the 2001-2003 tax cuts. And it's just amazing what an imbalance that creates. And it reminded me of how the imperative that a lot of folks on the left saw vis-a-vis -vis the debt deal that, well, we need to get revenue in the debt deal. But it's like, well, wait a second. Actually, you know, these tax cuts are going to expire. <laughs> and if they expire, that's actually much bigger right. than whatever savings are envisioned in the debt deal. So looking at this larger architecture, you know, that's fun. And it goes along with this implicit assumption that no one is ever going to allow that to happen, despite the fact that my sense is that a return to the Clinton-era tax rates is a decently plausible political case one could make. Uh, and then, of course, you can tweak and fix after this expiration happens from, you know, a very different baseline. But it's something I find incredibly interesting. So it's in the, I guess yes. it's in the DNA, I oh, guess, yeah. in the political I, DNA I, I, of I, Democrats I, who kind of had to run against, um, you know, anti-tax conservatives for a long period of time. Maybe, although, I mean, I think this, I think normally people just, like, make too much out of, out of messaging issues. But I, I think this has been, to some extent, a just a communications failure uh, on, on the part of the, the, the White House. Um, I have come to be persuaded over the past week um, that this threat is, in fact, much more credible than, than people recognize. That there's much more determination in the White House to not let this happen. Um, and that, uh, you know, a cave is, is relatively unlikely. Um, now, what's true, and I think sort of more relevant in, in these terms, is that... Um, there's an election, you know, right in 2012. Um, and so obviously, if Republicans win the election, right, I mean, President Romney or President Perry um, can and probably will quite swiftly reverse any uh, tax cut expiration uh, that, you know, Republicans showed uh, in, in the Bush administration uh, a great willingness to use the budget reconciliation process to push tax cuts uh, through Congress, which means that, you know, if they win, uh, they'll be in a position to do that, uh, you know, notwithstanding sort of, uh, you know, a counter-majoritarian elements of the system. Um, and so that, to me, is, like, the good reason to think that the actual tax baseline is very unclear yeah. at the moment, because it's, it's very dependent on the election outcome, rather than what Obama will do is unclear. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, right. So 
I mean, that's why I sort of thought this part of this baseline dispute with the S and P was a little bit funny. I mean, you can talk about current law versus current policy, but I mean, the the real way to write down the scenarios, right, is it's like you have the Rick Perry baseline and you have the Barack Obama baseline, uh, and you know they're just different. Well, they tell me about, uh, I don't know if you've seen it yet, but uh, Building America's Future, uh, this new think tank led by, uh, and a bankrolled, I assume, by uh, Michael Bloomberg, uh, that also and also Ed Rendell and Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, released this very ambitious uh, plan to ramp up infrastructure spending over the next decade. And, you know, I know yeah. that um, you're sympathetic to this idea. I have always been a great lover of infrastructure. I guess my main concern is that, uh, it was much like Alice Rivlin's concern during the stimulus debate, is just, I want to be sure that it's paid for. Um, and by that, I mean, I, I just really want to change the norm around which people assume that roads are something they should get for free, or rather, non-congested roads are something they should get for free. Um, but I wonder, I mean, what is your take on this, and do you think that the political stars are aligning such that we might see uh, much heavier infrastructure spending in the medium-term future. I know that the House Republicans released a proposal uh, for an incredibly moderate, uh, I'm sorry, not moderate, incredibly modest uh, reauthorization bill that would spend something on the order of $230 billion over the next six years, whereas the Building America's Future guys suggest that we need to spend $200 billion every year for the next 10 years. Uh, but uh, what are your thoughts on the infrastructure landscape? I really think that this is a, a like a pricing issue foremost, right? That, that, that the holdup with infrastructure is, you know, paying for things um, and that it's, um, you know, difficult to see sort of revenues forthcoming. Uh, you know, my dream is that, you know, American cities uh, and, and, and key suburbs should have... Uh, congestion pricing on their, their main roads and more market rate parking fees and, and things like that. Um, I believe there's some similar considerations around the, the pricing of water uh, in parts of the country where that's more of an issue. Um, and those kind of things would generate huge revenue streams. Um, and it would then be quite plausible to say, well, maybe a lot of that revenue should be spent on upgrading the infrastructure itself. Um, and it would also give us a clearer sense of where the actual demand for, for Oh, and it could, it could, it could, really it, is, it could be plowed in, by in the infrastructure itself, but also, I mean, the possibility that we neglect uh, in a crazy and extremely frustrating way is that it can be used to reduce our tax burden in other ways, or it can be used to pay for other valuable services. One thing that I've always, that's always driven me crazy is the idea well, right. that I mean, that, that would be used that, for that highways. Be... And just this idea that, well, it should only be used for this one activity that these people are paying for. But it's like, well, why wouldn't we use it in other modes of transportation or even for entirely other kinds of desirable, you know, public service? Um, right. Well, and, and I, I, that's exactly so, right? So, I mean, I, you know, if I think about, uh, well, think about New York, right? I mean, congestion pricing of Manhattan would generate, like, a stack of money, you know, of, of an unbelievable size. And then the political question facing the city council is, do we think there are transportation projects that we should be spending this stack of money on? Or do we think our constituents would like it better if we just gave them the money? Um, you know, and that's the right calculus to be making about public infrastructure investments. Uh, at some margin, it's better for us to all collectively give up some private consumption and get public services. And at other margins, it makes more sense for us to just have money and, you know, buy... When I think stuff. about parking fees uh, and congestion charges and things like that, I oftentimes uh, think of it uh, through the lens of the Alaska Permanent Fund. It's just, you know, here in a, yeah, uh -huh. in a dense, uh, large city, you just have this tremendous resource uh, in the form of people who want to come in and come out. Yeah. And then if you just capture some of the value of that, you could both, you know, kind of improve the allocation of that resource, but then you could also just have this, yeah, I mean, it, it's just incredible. And then if, a lot of the Alaska Permanent Fund, you create this yeah, situation there's this, where... Yeah, there's this know, And if you, you know, create this situation in which people who are residents are able to capture some of that, you create this kind of funny dynamic in which, well, gee, we also want this to be a desirable place to live, because then that creates more of this desire for people to crowd here that we can then milk. 
the way that we would otherwise milk, uh, for example, hydrocarbons in the ground. I mean, it's um, it's just this incredibly attractive idea. It also relates to the idea of the single tax, just you know, creating a tax that actually encourages yes. a city government to make the city a more desirable place to live, thus creating some kind of virtuous circle rather than creating these, you know, revenue streams that actually deter people from living in that place. Um, it's, uh, yeah. Right. I, I mean, I mean, exactly. I mean, it, it would be useful to have, um, yeah, I mean, revenue sources that sort of structure, like, what, what is the question that we are asking, right? And with, a, with something like a, like a land tax, right, one question to ask is, well, if we spend some money on planting trees on the boulevard, does that make this place desirable enough that the tax revenue actually goes up? Um, or is the value of those trees actually really low and we should do something else with, with the money? Um, you know, because the, the way it is now, it, it gets very, particularly when you talk about local services, I mean, it gets very airy. You know, people say, well, you know, we could save money by closing <laughs> the library on Wednesdays. And, and so Without having any sense of what the knock on effects of closing issue. it on Wednesdays, on Wednesdays are, yeah. Right, or like, who cares, right? It's, it's like you're not, nobody is... is monitoring it and it's like well you know i mean in principle we don't need any libraries but maybe we want them um you know and so the question we should be asking is well how much do we want them uh you know and what does it cost and, and what what is the value uh but it's um it's tricky if you're relying on you know retail sales tax and um capital gains taxes uh you know or, or it, particularly i mean municipalities tend to tax, you know, the assessed value of structure. So it's like, well, if people build fancier houses, then the revenue goes up. Um, but that's, you know, private creation of value cr creates more, more taxes. Um, and it's better to say, well, look, it, if we spend money on things that are valuable, that will support the revenue that supports yeah. the spending. Um, I mean, you know, there's no guarantee. Uh, of getting things right, but you'd at least be, I think, talking about... One thing I find interesting is the way that uh, in our meandering conversation, it inevitably comes back to charging people more for parking. And in my case, I have to say, it all comes down to the fact that I do not know how to drive a car. So this is just one of the rare instances in which my self-interest is completely naked. Uh, you know, I just really believe everyone else, you know, pay lots of money for parking, etc., pay vehicle license fees, pay whatever else, uh, and I would like a large check in the mail. Uh, that goes to everyone. I think that would be Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not much of a driver either, so it's, it's easy for me to say. Um, and, I, and I do try to think of, it's also know, good uh, for more, everyone. more sort of admissions against interest. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Um, you know, I'll support a, like, a heavy eyeglasses tag. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just yeah, there, no, there are many. Show, it's right, also, but, I mean, this is a kind of unrelated thing. Well, one thing that we didn't get to talk about as much as I would have liked is uh, tax reform ideas. And one idea that I'm very amenable to is the idea of age-dependent labor taxation, which you see in some places, and where in yes. one dimension it's a no-brainer. People over 65 should not be paying the Social Security payroll tax anymore. I mean, it, it just makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, uh -huh. it's just, you know, it discourages them from working. We should encourage them to do so. It makes them live longer. It's better for the system, et cetera. But, um, yeah, I, I, did, um, I did advocate in a radio commentary for Marketplace recently cutting taxes for young people, uh, which met with a lot of hostile reaction. Yeah. But the one thing that I was very careful to say... Probably from old thing, people. <laughs> the one thing that I was very careful to say is that I only want this to apply to people who are younger than myself, so that unlike my advocacy right. of... Uh, pricing mechanisms of all kinds for people to drive. Here's one area where I am saying to you, young people, I'm going to give you, uh, I, I hope to give you a tax break that I will not be able to partake in, uh, very bitterly. But I do think that it's right from my public policy. Now, I mean, yeah, I mean, now now, now that I'm 30, I feel more comfortable assessing this. Uh, <laughs> well, we, we, we can't be trusted you know. anymore, Matt, as I think uh, as I think you right. I think you know very well. Although, that is, that is true. Um well, okay. I I, yeah, I, I really course. need to go. It was great talking uh, to you. Man. The 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 age dependent taxation is is too. Oh, it's true. It's true. Too much to, to talk about. about it. All right. Uh, it was great chatting with Anyways, you. Anyway, good luck with the book. Yes. Talk to you good soon. talking to you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.